Everybody's being told to wash their hands these days. But this isn't a new thing, in fact. I've always been fascinated by this particular sink in the Villa Savoie outside of Paris, where Le Corbusier put the sink right in the hall. I finally got to see the real thing last year and took lots of pictures of it, because I've always wondered where did this come from. I thought it was at first a biblical illusion, because when people used to visit, they used to get their feet washed, and there is a Jewish tradition and an Islamic tradition of washing before meals or prayer. In fact, it's a much more recent phenomenon. It's actually discovered by this man, Ignaz Semmelweis, who was a doctor working in Vienna in about the 1820s. What was happening at the time is that the rate of childbed fever and maternal death had skyrocketed. It had originally been about 2%, and suddenly in Vienna and in a lot of places in Europe, it was up to close to 10%. And what Semmelweis found when he started looking around is that women who were being cared for by midwives were having their rate of death at about 2%, and yet on the other side of the hospital, where doctors were delivering the babies, that's where the rate was 10%. And he went looking around, well, what is the difference with, between one side of the hospital and the other? And what he found is that at the time, it was fashionable for doctors to do autopsies. And this made them learned. It showed that they were going in and studying what was going on. And basically, they didn't wash their hands or their shirts or anything else after they did the autopsies because they wanted to show how learned they were, that they were studying. It actually led to the belief that the dirtier the doctor, the better the doctor. And it was a point of pride to be walking around with their coats stiff with blood from the last autopsy. Well, Simmelweis immediately decided that the thing to do was to start washing between childbirth and washing between autopsy and childbirth. But nobody believed him. And he was the only one who was actually doing this. Most doctors ridiculed him. However, some did listen. Florence Nightingale, for instance, thought that waste came out of our bodies through the pores of the skin and the lungs and then got into the bed sheets. So she insisted that sheets get changed every day, that there be frequent baths, and that the, the, the doctors and nurses wash their hands between handling different patients. And in fact, the rate of infections and deaths in the wards that she was in control of dropped tremendously. And suddenly this became more standard practice. Finally, there was a doctor in 1865, Joseph Lister, who started using carbolic acid, or what we now know as phenol, and treating all of the instruments that he had, and even putting it directly onto people's injuries and finding that they didn't get gangrene anymore, that they actually didn't have to chop legs off because they could clean them up enough and have the bones fuse back together. And so all of the doctors who worked for him had to start wearing clean gloves and wash their hands before and after the operations. They often sprayed it into the air, although they later found that it wasn't needed anymore. Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur finally figured out what was going on when they developed the germ theory. And Pasteur connected the germ theory directly to Semmelweis's data and was far more successful than Semmelweis was in getting this out into the world. Semmelweis, in fact, was ignored. He went back to Hungary, where he was born. Uh, he finally was put into a men mental institution, got out of that, went back to work, cut his finger and died of the same diseases that, in fact, was killing all the women before he figured this out. Which brings us back to the sink in the hall. Basically, Le Corbusier was working for a doctor. The doctor had just been through the whole First World War and the tuberculosis that came from that. And then, of course, the Spanish flu that killed millions and millions of people. And as I mentioned in my whole lecture on modernism, this is where we got the sink in the hall. This is where we got the washable surfaces. And this is where we got minimalism. 
it's not a lesson that people actually learned and it wasn't widely adopted and hand washing didn't really catch on until, believe it or not, the 1980s when there were foodborne outbreaks of disease and the U.S. Center of Disease Control finally identified hand hygiene as a way to prevent the spread of infection. And that was the first time there was actually a national standard for washing hands, national recommendation for washing hands. And that's what brings us back to the history of the bathroom, which is what this lecture was going to be about. And this is a picture of the baths of Caracalla in Rome as they are today, and as they were 2,000 years ago, well, a little less than 2,000 years ago. I don't think they were built until about 300. They were vast halls which could handle many, many Romans who came at once. Every day they came to bathe. It was very important. It was a cultural center for the community, for the rich and the poor. Everybody went to the baths. And they went through a series of different kinds of baths. You would come in after changing into the tepidarium, the warm room in the middle, and then you could go to the hot room, the calidarium, or the frigidarium, the very cold room, to chill off. They were vast bits of engineering, heating up water in lead tanks that were all up here. You can see these reservoirs up at the top. They had a whole aqueduct sink serving them. Sometimes they were mixed. In later years, they were separated by sex, but uh, this quite dramatic rendering of it. And this is where people conducted business, like here's Laurence Olivier and John Gavin in, in Spartacus discussing the takeover of Rome. I was so impressed by the idea of baths that, in fact, my thesis for graduating at the University of Toronto School of Architecture was public baths for the city of Toronto, here out at the site of the urn generating station, which then was still burning coal and putting tons of hot water into Lake Ontario. I would take that hot water and I would put it through a series of pools, and then you could just swim out through that channel into the harbour. People think that bathing didn't happen very much until more recently, but in fact there were bathhouses in every town and city throughout Europe and England in the 14th and 15th century. And they were also used for entertainment. Here you can see people dining while they're in the tubs and then going next door. There were Turkish baths that were going constantly where people of both sexes would go for sex-separated bathing in the Muslim world, which required spiritual and physical cleanliness. In Asia, it was much more sophisticated. Cleanliness was critical, and there were baths in China. This is home bathing in China, but in Japan as well, it was communal. And there were bathhouses in every city, and often they were fed with hot water that was natural from hot springs because of the volcanic nature of the country. And a whole ritual was developed around it. People would take trips to go to the onsen, or the baths that were fired by natural springs. In the cities, they would build onsen, or baths, that were collective because people didn't have their own at the time but they're still in business because people still like it for the sociability and because of the various kinds of waters that they can get. Cleanliness was critically important. Note the difference between how you got clean there in a Japanese shower compared to a Western shower. You sit in the stool, you have a bucket, you fill the bucket, you use as much water as you need just for that rather than letting it run all the time, and you get yourself very, very clean. When I would go to a bath in Kyoto when I was in Japan, they really didn't like seeing Westerners in their baths and often would get out of the bathtub if they saw me coming. But I also had to make sure that I really made a demonstrative example of how well I was cleaning every part of me. I must have spent 15 minutes with this bucket and this hose, and they still got out of the tub. But when Westerners come, they have instructions, go naked, wash your private parts carefully, no running, no swimming, no washing in the tub. Or more graphically, this one. 
Japanese-style bathing has become popular in North America as well. And this is a wonderful book on how you can design a Japanese bath for a sort of Western society. The key thing that I still do, and I do now, well, I'll get into it later, is have the bathing separate from the pooping. But we'll get into that. In Japan, it was always separate. It was never in the same room because they are different functions. And not only that, but the waste from the toilet could be collected because it was really valuable. In fact, rich people got paid more for their poop than poor people because they ate better food and it made better fertilizer. Urine was collected as well because it was used for tanning leather and even for doing laundry. In China, they had a really sophisticated system of dealing with waste. You can see here uh, all of the canals which covered the city. People would go around with these canal boats. They would pick up the clay jugs of poop and they would take it upstream to the, to the farms where it would be spread on the farms and it was the fertilizer that was used. In Europe, it was much less sophisticated. The Romans had, as you can see here, flush toilets. These were feed, fed by water going underneath and they were communal and they were social. But most of the time, especially for the poor, conditions were just abysmal. Here you can see an English lodging house where everybody's crammed together up in the top sleeping. Everybody's in the middle level doing everything else and everything else, all the shit just goes down into the basement. There were night men who would come and they would take it away, theoretically, for the farmer's fields. There were toilets since the 15th century when John Harrington developed this toilet, but it basically just went into the river. It didn't really do anything that differently than just dumping a bucket and it didn't catch on. Water was delivered to people in London although, as this cartoon says, it wasn't very good. By 1800, uh, most of London had a supply, but in Soho, it was poor and it was relatively new and the private companies hadn't reached it yet. So people still got their water from a hand pump and would carry it by the bucket back to home where it was used. There was this one particular pump, though, that was very near a cesspit. The cesspit was what was where the outhouse was, which would go into a big pit below and would get cleaned out by those night soil men at some point. But this one leaked and it got through the casing of the pump and contaminated the water. And everybody was dying of cholera and nobody knew why until one guy, Dr. John Snow, came and actually did a map where he marked every house where someone was sick with cholera and found that they all focused around that one broad street Broad Street pump. And when he took the handle off that pump, the cholera disease went away. People stopped dying because they weren't drinking that water. He didn't know exactly what was in the poop that was getting into the water. They didn't understand all the germ theory yet, but there was a definite cause and effect. Now, when people had to carry water by the bucket from a pump to wash, Basically, you didn't use very much of it. It was heavy and it was hard. So here you can see how people often washed at the time. You basically had a washstand in your bedroom and you would use pitchers of water and a pail like that and you had a wash set and you cleaned yourself in the bathroom. Then what happened when people got piped water, they basically didn't have a bathroom yet. They didn't think of that. They basically took the washstand and changed the top or mounted the sink on the wall in the bedroom. Everybody who had running water basically had a tap in the kitchen and later they had a sink in the bedroom. The toilet was which was developed in around the beginning, the middle of the 18th century was not very sophisticated and it smelled a lot when it was in the houses because they finally were piping the waste away right from the toilet. And this was one of the first that was patented that actually had an S-trap at the bottom to catch the smells and stop the odors. It was a valve toilet though. You can see up here at the valve, which meant that it opened and the valves were made of leather and they often leaked, which was a constant problem. 
eventually they did figure out the to integrate the toilet with the trap like this, which is more like a modern toilet, and it used a lot of water. And people started installing it for multiple functions. The toilet wasn't just a toilet, it was also a urinal, which at the time people thought were completely different things, and a slop sink. It's a toilet, it's a slop sink. And Twyford was one of the companies that sold these by the thousands. Now people were putting them in their houses. You can see here, it's a shelf toilet. The, you poop up there. And these are still used in Germany and some other parts of the world where they actually believe the thing to do is inspect your poop before you flush it away so that you can see if there are any worms in it. Crapper is the famous name. Everybody thinks that Thomas Crapper invented the toilet. Really, he wasn't. He was just a really good marketer who built showrooms and people would go to the toilet store, which was Thomas Crapper's store. And he invented a better toilet tank for the wall. And he was selling, I think, the, among the first manufactured toilet paper, two-ply toilet paper patented across the empire. The trouble with all of this is it was done before there were actually any good sewers. And so all of it was just going into these ditches in the road, which were made into bigger ditches, which all flowed down to the Thames, and the Thames became totally polluted and contaminated and disgusting, and was basically killing everyone. And the, there was this big stink in 1854, where they basically had to stop holding parliament because it smelled so much that you couldn't go in the building. And it was killing people. It was a crisis. And so in the 1850s, uh, Sir Joseph Bazalgette actually started building these sewers across London that would divert water from the Thames. And they were when planning for it, he actually took the densest population he could imagine and made the pipes twice as big as they needed to be. He said then, well, we're only going to do this once and there's always the unforeseen and doubled the diameter. This meant that, in fact, when there was the population boom and the big buildings that were all built post the Second World War, the sewers, which would have run out in the 1960s, are still big enough to go right into the present. And it was a vast project, and it was completed incredibly quickly. They went later from to cast iron. And here you can see they divert all the water from the Thames, around the Thames, all down into the river. In America, they often built these pipes out of wood, and some of these wooden pipes exist till this day. I'm going to stop there, and there will be a part two to follow.